Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsena. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Jason Kenney's new plan for Alberta's COVID crisis. Let me be clear. We will not permit our health care system to be overwhelmed. But just next door, Saskatchewan plans to loosen up. Also tonight, why the Prime Minister was offering vaccine reassurance. Make sure you get your shot as soon as it's your turn. Lumber's gotten pricey, so timber's getting coached. They were organized, had all the equipment, they'd done their research, they knew the spot. And meteorologists celebrate a decade's worth of new U.S. data. When we update normals for Canada, we can expect to see some pretty dramatic warming. The impact's coming soon to your local forecast. This is The National. Vaccines are steadily rolling out across the country, and that gives everyone some hope. But as you'll see tonight, Canada's pandemic story is dramatically different province by province. Yeah, we'll show you one that's planning for eased restrictions, while others still fight to get this virus under control, like Nova Scotia, once the envy of the country. Today, it saw a record high number of new infections. And Alberta, where just tonight, the premier addressed his province province and announced new restrictions. Now they come as Alberta's COVID curve keeps on heading in the wrong direction. But as Carolyn Dunn shows us, there are questions about how any restrictions are being enforced. After treatment for breast cancer, Jennifer Hutchinson was ready for the next step, a hysterectomy to keep her hormone-fueled cancer from returning. With surgeries already cancelled due to COVID, her doctors simply couldn't book it. Well, it's scary for sure. I think, you know, as it goes on and as our hospitals and healthcare workers are more and more overwhelmed, I think, you know, if my cancer returned, would I be able to get care? There are growing concerns about resources for COVID patients too and plans to expand intensive care units because that may not solve the problem. We don't have the staff to manage 425 ICU beds with the expertise needed to look after these really sick patients that are on multiple life support machines. So tonight, Alberta announced new public health measures. Among them, all students from kindergarten to grade 12 will move to remote learning for three weeks. Personal services like salons will be shut down again and retail capacity will go down to 10%. Outdoor patios will also close. So let me be clear. We will not permit our health care system to be overwhelmed. We must not and we will not force our doctors and nurses to decide who gets care and who doesn't. Critics say new rules won't work if they're not enforced. So people were stunned when Calgary's police chief explained how far they'd been told not to go. Our partners at the province have asked us not to fill the courts with $100 mask bylaw tickets and to be more strategic in the enforcement. So we've done that. Before last weekend's unsanctioned rodeo, town officials raised the alarm with the province. Alberta Health Services only sent organizers a warning letter. It's just like ref in a hockey game. If you're not going to blow the whistle and give a penalty when an infraction occurs, then what's the point of having the rule there? Mm. And Carolyn, the Premier also announced bigger fines are coming for those who break the rules. Yeah, indeed. Kenny says fines for rule breakers will be doubled and that they're going to specifically target repeat offenders, Andrew. So that's not going to go over very well with people in this province who are against masks and against public health measures in general. In fact, while these measures were being announced, there was a, a, a large protest outside the government building right here in Calgary. As for those who have been calling for more restrictions, this will probably probably go a fairly long way towards satisfying them, even if they have come much, much later than they had hoped for. Carolyn Dunn, thank you very much. Nova Scotia is reporting a record 153 new cases today as it moves into its second week of a province-wide lockdown. COVID is real, it's here, and it can kill. And it's putting our healthcare system that we all rely on for one reason or another at risk. For the first time, Nova Scotia has had more than a thousand active cases of COVID-19. It also reported two deaths today. A woman in her 50s and a man in his 70s both reportedly died in their homes. 
Dr. Strang says he anticipates numbers will soon decrease as lockdown measures take effect and a backlog in processing tests is cleared. Now, life is different in Saskatchewan, where daily cases have been dropping, now below 200 for the first time in weeks. Today, the province touted its vaccination rates and spelled out a plan to reopen. Bonnie Allen explains the timeline. Another day, another rush at Regina's drive through vaccination clinic. Anyone age 37 and over now eligible to get the shot. We are very fortunate to have this opportunity. Many are parents whose kids went back to the classroom this week. I am diabetic, so, you know, with the kids going back to school and everything, like, I was just a bit nervous. Already, 65% of people over 40 have received one dose. We want to get past this. I think it's the right thing to do. I want to get things back to how they were. My kids need to get out. They need sports back. We need hockey. We need all that stuff. Let's get back to normal. Now, a three-step plan to do just that. This puts in place uh, what the finish line can potentially look like. It's a proven plan. As I said, it's, uh, it's worked in other areas of the world. There's no reason why it won't be as effective uh, here in Saskatchewan. Step one, three weeks after 70% of people over 40 get their first dose, among other things, restaurants and bars can reopen and private gatherings expand to 10 people. Step two, when people over 30 meet the same threshold, then casinos and theatres reopen and sports resume unrestricted. Step three hinges on those 18 and over getting their first dose and most remaining restrictions will be lifted, although gathering sizes are yet to be determined. I do think that 70% is the floor of the minimum requirements. I, I do obviously hope that the number will be much higher than 70%. Some say more than just vaccines must be considered before easing restrictions hospitalizations, caseloads, and not only vaccine rollout. That's a big part of it, but that cannot be the only metric. So now the push is on more than ever. Let's get more people out and get it done. The Premier says his plan will provide more incentive for people to get vaccinated. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Well, today Ontario reported a drop in the number of new COVID infections. At fewer than 2,800, it's the first time in a month it's been below the 3,000 mark. Tuesdays typically have had the week's lowest totals, but this is still a drop of nearly 500 cases from last week. Also today, the province said students will have the option of online learning for the next school year. Meantime, the Prime Minister is trying to reassure Canadians today about the safety of vaccines. You'll recall yesterday, advice from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization left many wondering which shot they should get. And as Hannah Thibodeau shows us, it's created a sharp divide with plenty of frustration and confusion. Make sure you get your shot as soon as it's your turn. Urging from the Prime Minister today, but also reassurance. Every single vaccine available in Canada has been approved by Health Canada as being both safe and effective. Yesterday, the government's own panel of experts created confusion with this advice. And what we've said all along is that the mRNA vaccines are the preferred vaccine. For a lot of people, preferred sounded like better and that Pfizer and Moderna are the ones to take. I was actually very upset and frustrated. And I she thinks the panel is focused too much on rare blood clots linked to AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. COVID is raging through our communities and the nuanced messages and complicated communications that Nazi has given actually confuses the patient population that I serve. And what they hear is AstraZeneca is bad. I don't know That's exactly what Krista Delaney heard. The instant reaction was confusion. She and her husband got the AstraZeneca shot and worries what's next. Do I get a second dose of it? Do I start all over with something else? This provincial lawmaker put things more bluntly. If a vaccine is approved by Public Health Canada and approved by Dr. Russell and her team, take that shot. Ignore NACI, ignore anti-maskers, ignore the people undermining faith in science. I can certainly understand why some um, individuals are, you know, concerned or getting frustrated. Today, Canada's chief public health officer said Canadians need to weigh certain factors before waiting for Pfizer or Moderna, including the risk level for blood clots, 
and whether they live in a COVID hotspot. And that advice on the second AstraZeneca dose will be coming soon. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. 13 COVID-19 cases have been confirmed among staff members at a federal quarantine hotel near Toronto's Pearson Airport. Health officials say the Crown Plaza Hotel will not be fully closed as it provides an essential service and the risk to the public remains low. However, inspectors have recommended improvements within the facility, which officials say have already been implemented by hotel staff. Now, some travelers flying into Canada are refusing to stay in quarantine hotels. And as Susanna Da Silva tells us, public health officials may not even be keeping track of all of them for fines or follow-up. Cynthia Vignola recorded herself refusing both the COVID test and a stay at a quarantine hotel after a vacation in Colombia. Me, I live in the countryside. So I think it's better for me to go home without neighborhood, without other people, than go in a hotel with bad organization. When CBC asked the Public Health Agency of Canada how many people had done this, a spokesperson admitted that PHAC has no idea. Vignola was promised a fine in the mail. That was six weeks ago. I didn't receive nothing. No calls, no other tests. Nothing. PHAC says 513 people have gotten tickets for refusing, but those are only for travellers landing in Vancouver and Toronto. As for Montreal and Calgary, talk to local officials, PHAC says, because enforcement falls under local jurisdiction. While Quebec prosecutors told CBC no tickets have been given there, and Calgary police say they haven't issued any fines either. Snowbird Alan Prout returned from Mexico a week ago. He too says he felt safer quarantining at home in Saskatchewan. He hasn't received a ticket yet. I think it's like a jigsaw puzzle missing pieces. It was poorly thought out. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about enforcement today. We uh, certainly hope that uh, there will be a, a greater access to data that uh, can reassure people that those fines are indeed being applied and enforced everywhere across the country. This infectious diseases specialist says it is important for Canadians to see equal consequences. If you don't enforce it for everybody, then it becomes kind of a, a pointless program. The leader of the NDP calls the current approach a failure. The international travel question is a serious one because it does introduce new variants. Meanwhile, since posting her videos, Cynthia Vignola says she gets asked weekly for information by people looking to do the same. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, India's COVID crisis today soared past 20 million total reported cases, second only to the United States. And for the 13th day in a row, the country recorded 300,000 daily infections. Despite being the world's biggest producer of vaccines, only about 10% of India's population has received its first dose, and just 2% has been fully vaccinated. And when it comes to equitable access to COVID vaccines, the international community had a plan. But as Vicodopia tells us, that's not how it's playing out around the world. A renewed vaccination push in the face of disaster. India, which helped Canada with its vaccine supply, is now itself in need, like so many other developing countries. Just over one in three people in Canada has received at least one dose of a vaccine. That's compared to less than one in a hundred in low-income countries. That's vaccine inequity. That inequity is stark. Israel, the U.S., U.K. and Canada have made huge strides towards vaccinating their citizens, while Ukraine, the Philippines, Pakistan, Venezuela, Egypt and Nigeria are just starting. The global initiative COVAX was supposed to prevent this inequity from happening by coordinating a fair distribution of vaccines. Some wealthy countries are starting to share. Sweden, Portugal, France and New Zealand are together donating millions of doses to COVAX, despite vaccinating less of their own populations than Canada. Well, we haven't been hoarding them. At the summit of the world's most advanced economies, the foreign affairs minister defends Canada's decision to hold off sharing its vaccines with the world, despite requesting almost 2 million doses from COVAX in February, the only G7 country to ask. We will be in a position in due course to be able to say, OK, now we are in a situation where we have 
uh, we're, we're confident uh, that we have a surplus. It's a farce how we are distributing the vaccines right now. This infectious disease doctor has harsh words for Canada, which, despite donating money to COVAX, he says should do more. I could grade it as a, like a D minus, I'll say. It's not an F because at least they're talking about equity. He warns no single country is fully protected unless all are protected. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. U.S. President Joe Biden has announced a new vaccination goal for Americans, and he has his eye on the country's Independence Day. Our goal by July 4th is to have 70% of adult Americans with at least one shot and 160 million Americans fully vaccinated. So that means giving close to 100 million shots in the next two months. The new phase could also include incentives such as shopping discounts for those vaccinated. About 56% of adult Americans have already received at least one shot. Well, questions about safety and demands for accountability tonight in Mexico City after a catastrophe on its transit system. A terrible loss of life when an overpass collapsed, sending a commuter train crashing to the ground below. Sasha Petrosik shows us the aftermath. Subway line 12 is Mexico City's so-called golden line, but today it smashed steel hung over a south end neighborhood. Bits of track and crumbling pillars of the overpass scattered below. A crash happened around 10.30 last night. CCTV footage shows an elevated portion collapsing onto the traffic of a busy street below throwing up clouds of debris. In the moments that followed, dust filled the air and stunned bystanders rushed to the rescue, posting on social media. Open it, smash it open with something, says one man, as others pry at subway doors and try to pull drivers from flattened cars. My brother and his wife were in their car, he says. They got her out, but he was crushed. We don't know what happened to him. Rescue workers spent hours pulling out the dead and injured as Mexico questioned the cause. Many suspect shoddy construction and corruption among those who built this transit line 10 years ago. An emergency rescue official wondered if the city's frequent small earthquakes might have weakened the structure. Officials have promised a full investigation. The Mexican people must know the whole truth, said President Andres Manuel López Obrador, as he gave the victims' families his condolences. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. A BC woman has been airlifted to hospital with serious injuries after she was attacked by a cougar. It happened on her property about two hours east of Vancouver. BC's Environment Ministry says cougars attacked and injured five people last year, but no human has been killed by a cougar in the province in 20 years. Well, the pressure that the pandemic's put on hospitals is well known, but it's also taking a huge toll in Canada's courthouses. Justice delayed, fears of justice denied. Ottawa says it has a plan, but not everyone's on side. Olivia Stefanovich explains. The situation is mind-boggling to me right now. I am having sleepless nights. Facing one court postponement after another, personal injury lawyer Jasmine Dea says she's struggling to explain to her clients why justice is delayed. Now, my client who has a brain injury that requires 24-hour care, that has no access to funds, that has no ability to pay for someone to take care of him, I, I can't help him. I can't bring closure. She's far from alone in her frustration. An estimated 100,000 cases are on hold just in Ontario. An existing problem made worse after a directive to combat the third wave by the Superior Court Chief Justice, deferring as many matters as possible, including virtual hearings. Similar delays are happening across the country. And yes, some cases have been moved back, cases that could, uh, but they will be heard as soon as they can. And we're going to continue to ensure through technology and other means uh, that, that we continue to have uh, a, a well-functioning court system. The Justice Minister says proposed funding will help reduce the strain on the system. 
It includes almost $50 million over the next five years to create 13 new Superior Court judicial positions and more than $10 million a year after that period to keep them on the bench. A lot of important initiatives that are being supported, um, but uh, there's still more work to be done. But some in the legal community say the federal plan does nothing to immediately relieve the pressure. Right in the trenches, we need the files to move. We need the proceedings to occur. The federal government says it's helping how it can, but ultimately provinces are in charge of the administration of justice in their jurisdictions. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. As the demand for lumber rises, so does theft in Canada's force. Something like this is not being taken for firewood, that's for sure. And this brazen poaching often comes with little consequence. Plus, the cost of healthcare burnout. We're literally working on the very last drop of fuel that we have. Three frontline workers talk about the emotional toll of an ongoing crisis. And new U.S. data shows seasonal temperatures are rising. What about in Canada? The growing season seems to be extending a wee bit. But Canadian meteorologists are stuck using old data. We're back in two. PEI's spring lobster season is officially underway after bad weather caused a four-day delay. About a thousand boats were out at harbors around PEI. The industry has been hit hard by the pandemic, but there's talk of record prices this year. The season generally runs until the end of June. Now we have told stories about the high cost of lumber these days. And if you've tried to build anything, you know all about those costs. But on Vancouver Island, there's a new twist to these troubles. People are stealing trees, big ones. Briar Stewart shows us the scene of the crime and the calls for a crackdown. This is the first tree I tripped across when I came out here. And uh, as you can see, it's a uh, pretty big western red cedar. This is one of a few stumps Larry Pinn has stumbled on. This nearly 90-year-old tree was chopped down illegally. Something like this is not being taken for firewood, that's for sure. It's a, it's a valuable tree. Right, and these are like big slabs of, of wood here. Yeah, yeah, they are. And someone was really knew what they were doing. They were organized, had all the equipment. They'd done their research. They knew the spot. The tree was part of North Cowichan's Municipal Forest Reserve, a 5,000-hectare area on the east side of Vancouver Island. The landscape here is considered endangered because of logging and development, but in this case, the tree was poached, and about 100 others have been as well since the beginning of the year. Since we've noticed the, the increase in the timber theft, we've uh, increased patrols to daily patrols in all the active areas. We've increased signage to make sure it's very clear that this activity is not permittable. In this forest, the municipality is responsible for penalties, but when the theft happens on Crown land, enforcement rests with the province. We rely in part on complaints from the public, and we've had over 500 of those over the last 10 years. I would say there's uh, some indication that that is increasing. Someone caught tree poaching in BC could be fined up to a million dollars, but most of the time people are just given a ticket for a few hundred, that is if they're caught at all, which is why some want to see stricter enforcement. In North Cowichan, the municipality is considering raising its fine, which is now just $200. Not very much considering the price of lumber is up dramatically. 232% across the board, but for some woods, and particularly you know, high value, as I say, for bespoke type uh, projects, people will pay a lot more. So we're looking at 500% increases for some lumbers. Isil Dobell believes there should be tougher punishment, not only to protect the trees, but deter people from driving through sensitive ecosystems to haul out lumber. I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of outrage about this happening and you're stealing from the community, you're stealing from Canadians, you're stealing from nature. And she says would-be poachers should know that residents are watching these woods. Briar Stewart, CBC News, North Cowichan, B.C. An update now on our story about a Canadian widower's battle for pension benefits. Ken Hare's husband died in 2012 after a 30-year career with CN Rail. But the pension plan did not then recognize same-sex relationships, leaving Hare without access. Tonight, that's changed. Ken Hare reached out to tell us that CN will now offer him 
pension benefits going forward with a lump sum for all withheld payments since 2012 and a letter recognizing him as a spouse. The relentless pandemic is taking a toll on health care workers. My average work day is probably 14 to 16 hours a day for seven days a week. The pressures of working in a strained ICU. And I speak with a psychologist on coping under extreme stress. Next. Well, nearly 14 months into this pandemic, the pressure on hospitals and healthcare workers has never been greater. ICUs are packed, staff exhausted. Tonight, through the experiences of a respiratory therapist, an ICU doctor, and a paramedic. We get a look into that world and at the immense toll this is all taking. The pace and the volume has definitely increased. We had planned throughout this uh, pandemic for a surge. So the plans that we had hoped to never use, we're now having to use them. The emotional strain of, you know, potentially preventable illness, seeing really young patients now die. I, I don't know what the long-term kind of mental health effects will be for myself and my colleagues. Um, all I can say is it's tough. But everyone is just so burnt out and tired. Um, and we're literally working on the very last drop of fuel that we have. We're not the front line anymore. We're the last line of defense. Um, and it's just, it's been so difficult in that regard. My name's Amanda Rampersad and I've been a respiratory therapist for four years. So my job involves airway management as well as management of life support as well as providing oxygen therapy. In the ICU, um, it's almost triple of our workload. One day we had four to six cardiac arrests during the day. There were patients coming down left, right, and center from the wards to our ICU who were just failing from COVID. You don't really know at this point what you're walking into, but you know that it's going to be very, very bad. My average work day is probably 14 to 16 hours a day for seven days a week. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Wilcox. Uh, I'm an ICU doctor at the Toronto Western Hospital. So last week, which was one of the busiest days that I can remember in my career, I walked approximately 23,000 steps, which is 17 kilometers. You know, people might have heard about proning, which is essentially when we put people on tummy time. So we roll them from their back to their front, and that actually improves their oxygen levels. And to do that, you know, that can take four to eight people. And you need a physician in the room, you need a nurse in the room, you need a respiratory therapist in the room. So it can take 45 minutes to flip a patient safely. If we have two or three patients a day, then that's not too laborious, but now you're looking at dozens of COVID patients in a unit. It's a tenuous situation right now. There's, there's no two ways about it. And the utilization of the bus is just another way that we can maximize the way that we use the paramedics. My name is uh, Justin Smith. I'm the chief flight paramedic at Orange. The volume that we're moving out and the regularity with which we're doing it is not something I've ever seen before. COVID is taking out entire families, like entire families, not just a grandma or a grandpa, uh, but a mom and a dad and an aunt and an uncle and a brother all from one family and it's not and that is not a rarity so that's what scares me is that that's going to continue and i think that's what a lot of people don't understand or necessarily see is the moral distress and the compassion fatigue that a lot of frontline staff are going through you know we're there and we're trying to hold our patients hands like through the very end of it not being able to do that is what takes the toll to provide kind of that human component is probably the most rewarding part of our job. But it's also the most uh, emotionally taxing. And to have to do that over the phone, to listen to someone cry and break down on the phone versus being able to hold their hand or you know give them a hug at the bedside, it's the saddest part of the pandemic for sure. 
yes, we have experienced like death and dying before. This is this is a part of our job, but it's just a completely other different level of it. I remember coming home from a shift and someone in their 30s had passed away. And I just, I went to bed and I looked at my husband and I said, oh my God, that could be you. When you get into this type of work, you understand that at some point through your career, you may be asked to do something or be part of something that's um, extraordinary. And this is that thing. Um, so for me, I sort of lean on that. I have an amazing husband and an amazing family who are there for me. And we also got a puppy this year, so he worries about me for sure. Like if I come home crying after a shift, he runs and he jumps and he tries to lick my tears away. So I can't worry about the long-term effects because we're going to be paralyzed, right? And so, you know, this is what we train to do. This is what we're going to do. And how much therapy am I going to need afterwards? Uh, I've gone from once a month to every two weeks. My therapist probably thinks I need weekly, but you know, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. You know, whenever I go into an ICU, people are trying to keep it upbeat, right? They're, they're, you can see that they're actively trying to not let it get them down. That's something I've not really seen, that sort of active participation in making sure that everybody else is okay, even if they're a stranger, you know, you know how are you, how, are you keeping okay? So that gives me hope. The human race has survived many pandemics, right? And so eventually this is gonna end and maybe the pandemic will highlight different inequities in our society that maybe we'd actually be more motivated to change. There's always something bright that comes out of tragedy and I think that that's probably what it's going to be. So let's talk a bit more about what these healthcare workers are going through with Dr. Melanie Joannis. She's a psychologist in Ottawa, and some of her patients also work in healthcare. And Dr. Joannis, we heard Amanda there mention compassion fatigue, literally mm -hmm. holding her patients' hands until the moment they die. That, I mean, it's, it's striking that what has probably drawn these folks to care for other people in the first place is what is draining them. That feels like a real yeah. crisis. Yeah, it's what we call the cost of caring, right? It's, um, it's something that we're seeing that I think we need to differentiate from burning out, which burnout can tend to happen when there is a high work uh, stress level, high demands and very low resources or support, which healthcare workers have to go through and deal with. But compassion fatigue has much more to do with, you know, being exposed repeatedly to people who are suffering, who are not doing well, and the emotional toll that that can have on the worker which unfortunately what tends to happen is they tend to disconnect from their own selves and not be able to be as empathic, let's say, with others, which and, is the unfortunate part. Right, and, and you wrote, I understand, a guide for healthcare workers last year on, on taking care of their mental health. So, so tell me, how do you help someone who is in such a taxing position as that? Yeah, one of the first key is to really be able to recognize that this is happening to you because healthcare workers have been really taught to just kind of dismiss any types of feelings that they have and just go for it. And, you know, the self-sacrifice is very high in healthcare workers. And we really want to work with them in terms of identifying how are you doing, right? You're asking everyone else how they're doing in a day, but how are you doing and identifying where, where you're struggling and being able to not necessarily feel ashamed of that, but just recognize that and turn that compassion inwards and say it's okay if you're struggling it's okay if you're having a bad day and uh, how can we help support you and there's different strategies that they can find uh, to do that but the first piece is really identifying it and being able to recognize that they're allowed to struggle they're superheroes but they can struggle yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely and and I'm curious to know just before I let you go what you think the takeaway should be for the general public from what we've just heard I think it's it's try to keep uh, them in our minds, right? Because I think it, the toll the pandemic is having such a toll on all of us, and we're all tired of it, and we all you know want this to end. But to really be mindful that our actions, our decision making process is really going to impact how these people, um, you know, their everyday lives and how well they can they can cope with it. And I think it's really important to keep that on our radar. That I you know I, I come up in the morning and when I you know, complain about my day, I recall, you know, at least I'm not in an ICU with five pounds of P90 
PPE on myself and trying to save someone's lives, like that's a lot uh, mm -hmm. to cope with. And I'm really grateful for the healthcare workers. And I think that's what we need to, to focus on here. We hear you loud and clear. Uh, Dr. Joannis, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Now for some, getting a dog has been a pandemic stress relief, but unscrupulous importers have been bringing in sick dogs under some terrible conditions. People in Canada that will spend a lot of money for dogs and just won't ask the questions to figure out where they came from. Now the government is cracking down the new regulations to stop bad breeders. We're definitely in the last two cycles considerably warmer than in the 20th uh, century as a whole. But first, the U.S. has released new data on seasonal temperatures. So why are Canadian meteorologists still using outdated information? Next. Welcome back. We have all had to get used to a lot of new normals during the pandemic. But a highly anticipated report out of the United States will set a new normal when it comes to how we look at weather and climate change. Cameron McIntosh walks us through what it says and what it could mean for this country. Eight degrees in Winnipeg. A little cool, but for early May, not too bad. Right in the range of what's considered normal. The ground's still a bit cold. We're still getting minus temperatures at night. Still, last couple of years, Eric Stoby has been getting into his garden plot a little earlier. Not drastic change, but... Things are changing, you know. Um, especially the weather and the growing season seems to be extending a wee bit. So who decides what's a normal temperature? Forecasters, meteorologists, TV weather people all use an international standard based on a 30-year average. Normals. In Canada, normal is determined by data between 1981 and 2010. That's currently under revision. In the meantime, the United States just updated its normals. We're definitely in the last two cycles considerably warmer than in the 20th uh, century as a whole. According to data gathered by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, most of the U.S. saw a 10-year rise of average temperatures, in some places as high as a degree and a half. With more extreme weather, as the western U.S. gets drier and the eastern U.S. gets wetter. We actually see the signature, the fingerprint of climate change. Uh, as it's ongoing. The NOAA analysis produced for the U.S. Um, is very much in line with what we're seeing uh, across other countries and other regions. Including Canada, where consensus is climate change is working at a much faster pace. We update normals for Canada, we can expect uh, to see um, some pretty dramatic warming. Back in the garden plot, the hope is just for a good growing season. We shall see. Some are still to come. Canada is expected to update its normals next year. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. So as we've heard, these new climate normals are especially important to broadcast meteorologists. Handy then that we have one of this country's best standing by, our own Johanna Wagstaff. So Joe, you were looking forward to these new numbers today. What do they mean to you? Well, Adrian, being able to compare the temperatures and conditions that we feel to some sort of baseline is everything for a meteorologist. Uh, it not only gives the public, you know, context when it comes to the weather, but it's one of our best tools for communicating climate change. It's sort of the lens that we're able to talk about our shifting climate. So the fact that our baseline is shifting is a big deal. You've probably heard of the phrase, weather is what you get, climate is what you can expect, and those expectations are shifting. And I think it's probably time we said goodbye to the 80s. You know, a hot mm -hmm. summer May or hot May day in 1983 is uh, a normal day for most of Canada in the 2020s. So uh, yes, time to say goodbye to the uh, 80s, I think, Adrian. If, if we have to. So, so have Canada's to. normals are about to be released as well. What will you be looking for there? I think we're going to see the same sort of shift, even in the past decade, you know, somewhere between half a degree to uh, well over two degrees for parts of Canada. I'm really looking for that change in the north. I just wanted to show you a snapshot of the afternoon temperatures across Canada today. Interestingly, today is a seasonably cool day across the country, with the exception of a Iqaluit. Right now, they're about three degrees 
above their seasonal, but this is only up until 2010. So when you bring in the next decade, today might be an exceptionally cool day across the country and a Iqaluit might be uh, more towards the norm. So uh, really watching for these numbers and I'm sure I'll see you back here when, uh, when we get the Canadian ones in. You bet, Johanna Wagstaff, thank you. You're welcome. Well, the government is clamping down on deceitful dog sellers. So you can still bring in large numbers of animals and still potentially bring them from some dodgy situations, but it makes it harder. The government adding new rules to prevent unethical imports and dogs dying en route. Next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, how the Liberals' attempt to regulate streaming services like Netflix is turning into a controversial debate about free expression. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, a Belgian farmer who lives in this town near the border with France has single-handedly made his country's territory a little bigger. He unknowingly moved this marker, laid down more than 200 years ago, about two meters inside French territory. Authorities have reportedly asked the farmer to move the marker back. Okay, after CBC News investigations into the poor health of imported puppies, the federal government is imposing new regulations, but not everyone is satisfied with them. Alison Northcott has the details. These puppies arrived at this emergency shelter six weeks ago. Humane Society International says Canadian authorities intercepted them at the border over their importers' fraudulent paperwork. We need very strong sanctions for people trying to import dogs that are not meeting requirements to make sure that there is no longer a profit attached to it. Animal imports are regulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Last year, CFIA launched an investigation after a flight arrived in Toronto from Ukraine with hundreds of puppies on board, including 38 that had died. Now, the government is introducing new rules to crack down on shipments of dogs under eight weeks for breeding, resale or adoption that don't meet Canadian requirements. Importers will soon have to specify how many dogs they're importing, ensure dogs have rabies vaccines at least 28 days before coming to Canada, provide travel route information, and have an approved quarantine facility available if needed. So you can still bring in large numbers of animals, you can still potentially bring them from some dodgy situations, but it makes it harder. Dr. Scott Weiss says buyers have a role to play too. The problem is people in Canada that will spend a lot of money for dogs and just won't ask the questions to figure out where they came from because they're in a hurry or they haven't taken the time to look or they just don't want to know. Humane Society International worries what will happen to puppies that don't meet import requirements since CFIA can't automatically seize them. And if they're returned to the country of origin, we know that uh, we're sending them to an uncertain fate. Elizabeth Pierce runs a rescue and is a small-scale breeder. She says she does plenty of research and paperwork when she imports just one puppy. She wants more safeguards against unscrupulous importers bringing in a lot of dogs to sell for big money. It's very difficult. It's just that people don't know where they're coming from. They just don't know the background and they shouldn't be bringing in that many. The CFIA says there's no limit on the number of dogs an importer can bring in, but they have to meet animal health and humane transport requirements. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And Winnipeg Taylor is marking a special anniversary by spreading a little joy. Helping others after he was helped 41 years later. Stay with us. May 4th marks an important date for a Winnipeg man. Tam Wynn, sandwiched there, and please pardon the pun, between his wife and son, is celebrating a special anniversary. So 41 years ago, Wynn fled Ho Chi Minh City, then known as Saigon, and settled on Canadian soil as a refugee. His annual thanks is our moment. Today we are making a uh, uh, Vietnamese sub, they're called Ban Mi. We make a uh, hundred of them to go down to donate for my anniversary. Decades ago, Tam headed to Canada at the age of 23 with not much more than the clothes on his back. One of the hundreds of thousands who also fled Vietnam after the war and eventually reached Canada. CBC News has spoken with Tam in the past about his terrifying journey and what motivates him to give back to this country. I know how it feels hungry, how it feels thirsty, how it feels scary. 
That's why I want to do every year, every anniversary, to give it all and help. In Winnipeg, he came to be known as Tam the Tailor and says in his community, he's found freedom. We all come to Canada and we help each other, try to do good with each other. What it doesn't matter what, how big, how small, you can help. And he not only helps, he's extremely hardworking in the sense that, that he started this uh, working as a tailor in uh, 1986 on Ellis Avenue. He is still there and has <laughs> gone on to, to own commercial buildings. Right. Yeah, not bad for a guy who, I mean, he tells us he, he did speak English when he came here. He really just had to make it all work. But clearly he remembers how difficult it was, mm -hmm. right, when he was starting out and so sees the need to help people. And that's a great thing. That's The National for this May 4th. Have a good night. Good night.